Well, good morning. You know, there are some things uh, in life that just don't naturally go together. And, you know, I love coffee. Any, any coffee lovers? All right. But, and I also love lemons. I like anything with lemon, right? I used to just eat whole lemon slices, rind and all, when I was younger. But coffee and lemon don't what? They don't mix. They don't go together. So I decided one day to do a little scientific research known as a Facebook poll. All right, it is the absolute best way to do research. It's absolutely always right. But I asked Facebook, what are some things that don't go together? And so I got a, a list of things. Uh, politicians and answering questions. <laughs> Cats and dogs, water and electricity. Bleach and ammonia, don't try that. Dogs and the UPS man. <laughs> Coffee and sushi. Puppies and a new carpet. A clean house and kids. You probably have done that to your parents' house. Peanut butter and mustard. Diets and church dinners. Eagles fans and Cowboys fans. Go fly, Eagles fly. Eagles fans and anyone else. <laughs> Waffle mix and garlic powder. Plaids and prints. That will help some of you. And now this last one that I have is going to be controversial. But I want to assure you that I am right. And if you disagree with me, you're wrong. Pineapple and pizza. It, it evokes strong emotions and reactions, but I love pizza, I love pineapple, but never together. They don't belong together. There's one more pair of things that, that we wouldn't naturally put together, and that's obedience and joy. Obedience and joy. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word obedience or the word obey, joy is not the first thing that comes to my mind. Anybody with me? Obedience and joy are things that just naturally I would not put together. In fact, many times we feel like joy will come from getting to do what? What I want to do. I can't wait to move out of my parents' house because then I will what? Do what I want. And then I will be free. Then I will be happy. Then I will be most joyful, when I don't have to answer to anyone, when I can do what I please. There's something about obedience. Now, some of you, by nature, are sort of rule followers. How many of you would say, I'm a rule follower? Not bad. How many of you would say, by nature, I am not a rule follower? All right, keep your hand up. Your counselors are getting your names down. All right. Yeah, some of us, self-included, by nature, you know, when I see a list of rules, I want to go over it and think, which ones of these are Fly, and which ones can I get around? In fact, when I came back uh, to Chehi uh, to be a uh, chapel speaker, the, the, the director then, uh, he actually sent me a list of the rules. I don't know why. It might have been that he was the head counselor when I was a camper. Um, but he sent me a list of the rules. And there were even more rules then than when I was a camper. Again, I may have been partly responsible for that. But I looked at all the rules when I was coming back to be a chapel speaker, and I thought, this is going to be an awful week. Man, this place is filled with rules. When I got here, I realized it's not actually that bad. But there's just something about obedience and rules that we think that isn't, that's, that's restrictive. That's, that's not good. But I want to share with you this morning that obedience to Jesus is the pathway to genuine joy. Obedience to Jesus is the pathway to genuine joy. Uh, this week, our theme is, is Fresh Start, as I shared last night. And it's my prayer for you, it's my, it's my prayer for myself, my prayer for all of us, that, that our time here would give us a fresh start. God is a God who delights in giving us fresh starts. Aren't you thankful for that? Right? Aren't you thankful that, that God gives do-overs, that God gives us second chances, and he gives us new opportunities for new beginnings. And camp for me, you know, when I came here, I shared a little bit about this last night, camp for me very much was a fresh start for me. It was a time where I realized that although I was a Christian, I was saved, I knew Jesus, and I loved him. 
And, and as I shared last night, I loved going to church. In fact, church was the place I think I, I felt most at home, most accepted, most loved, and I'm grateful for that. But I wasn't living out my faith. I was in some ways intimidated or scared to live out my faith because I thought I wouldn't fit in or be liked or accepted. What I realized is that that actually caused me to fit in less because I was stuck in this world of I don't do certain things because I love Jesus and I want to follow him, but I, I don't really want to be outspoken about my faith or actually live out my faith. And it, it sort of left me in a, in a weird spot. And it was while I was here that God convicted me right, of, of that and of how I was living and that he had a different path for me, a new path for me to live. And do I, did I do that perfectly? No, none of us lived the Christian life perfectly. But God launched a fresh start in my life, a fresh start that didn't just last a little bit but that has fruit that's continuing on. My prayer for us is that we wouldn't just kind of get a high from being at camp and come back on fire, and then a week later it disappear. But that God would do something in us, something in you, something in me, that would have effects that would last for our lifetime and ultimately for eternity. And so we're going to look at obedience today. We're going to talk about wisdom. We're going to talk about love, light, and faith this week. But as we think about obedience... um, you know, God's people have always struggled to obey. In fact, when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them, anybody remember how many rules he gave them to follow? One. One. Wouldn't that be great? One rule, right? One, here's, here's this amazing world that I've made that, for you to enjoy, to be blessed by, for you to have dominion over, for you to experience. And all you have to do is not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Just don't do this one thing. But, of course, even that one thing became too much of a temptation for them. And so from Adam and Eve to Moses, right, Moses struggled to obey. I mean, Moses, the man of incredible faith, but there were times he struggled to obey. David, the man after God's own heart. We're going to talk about him a little bit more this week. But he struggled to obey God. Solomon, right, the list of the whole nation of Israel. The story of the Bible is the struggle of people to obey and follow what God has said. And so how do we, how do we actually live a life of obedience? What does that mean and what does that have to do with a fresh start? So I want to invite you, we're going to begin in the Gospel of John chapter 15 and then we're going to be in Philippians chapter 2. John chapter 15 and then Philippians chapter 2. And so I'm praying for you And I'm praying for myself that God's going to give us a fresh start, a new beginning. Obedience to Jesus is the pathway to genuine joy. So before we get to John chapter 15, I just want to read one verse from Psalm 128. You don't have to turn there. But Psalm 128 verse 1 says this. It says, how happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And so the psalmist there says, How happy, how joyful is everyone who fears God, who reverences God, sees God for who He is, and who walks in His ways. And so, even from this verse, we realize that there is a connection between obedience to Jesus, obedience to God, and joy. And while on the surface we might not think about obedience and joy as being something that goes together, they absolutely do. So John chapter 15 Verse 9, the scene for this, this passage from John is that Jesus is with his disciples. It is the night before the crucifixion, right? Jesus is keenly aware of what is going to transpire just in the next few hours. But his disciples don't know. They know something's different. They know something's weird. They know something's un- unusual about this evening. Jesus is speaking really in ways that he's never spoke to them before. And Jesus is sharing with them the deepest things of his heart. He's preparing them not only for the events that they will go through in the next few hours, seeing him arrested, put on trial illegally, handed over to Pilate, beaten, mocked, tortured, and led away to be crucified. Their world crushed, even though Jesus tried to explain it to them. Have you ever had someone try to explain something to you, but you just didn't get it? And the disciples had no grid, no mindset for a crucified Messiah. That was not something they they could understand or wrap their minds around. And so when Jesus died, they were distraught. They were discouraged. They were disillusioned. They, 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 They thought it all had ended. But of course we know it didn't. On the third day, Jesus rose from the dead. And Jesus is preparing them for what they're about to go through. Not only for that, but he's preparing them for what life will be like when he ascends back to the Father. And they are sent out as his disciples, as his apostles, with the good news, with the great 
commission, right? To go and to make disciples of all ethnic groups, of all nations. And so Jesus is preparing them for that. And here's what he says in John chapter 15, verse 9. He says, as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. So remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So notice, notice a few things here that Jesus says. He says, as the Father has loved me, right? Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, has always existed. He's the eternally existent Son of God who has existed with the Father and with the Spirit. And he says, as the Father has loved me, there is perfect love in the Trinity. One God, three persons, who experience perfect relationship and perfect love. And so Jesus looks at his disciples that night. He says, as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. And think about, what did he do just a, a, a little while before he says this? He washed their feet. Remember as, he, as they shared the, the Passover meal and as Jesus told them that from now on this Passover meal will be a representation of what I am going to, that the Passover didn't just look back to Egypt, but it looked forward to me. It looked forward to what I would ultimately do to be the ultimate Passover for sin. And as he, as he shared that meal with them, no one had washed feet, right? Because washing feet was a job for the most menial servant. And so when the disciples came into the room to have the meal, I'm sure they all sort of looked at each other and thought, I'm not washing feet, Right? I'm, I'm Peter's brother. I'm Peter, right? I'm the leader. Leaders don't wash feet, right? And down the line they went. And so Jesus gets up in the middle of the meal and he goes over to the corner of the room where the basin and the towel were for foot washing. And I'm sure it was really like, what in the world is he doing? What's going on? And he washed their feet, right? He, he took on the role of the most menial servant. He washed his disciples' feet. And then he says, he says, do you understand, after he got done, I don't think, other than Peter asking for his feet not to be washed, and then when Jesus said, hey, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have part of me, and then Peter's like, can I have a bath, right? And Jesus is like, whoa, Peter, like, just feet, all right? And, and then he says, do you understand what I did for you? And do treat each other the way I've treated you. And so now... A little while later, he says, as the Father has loved me, I have loved you. I've shown you my love, right? Jesus had shown them his love, not just in foot washing, but in choosing them and calling them, in rescuing them and teaching them. And he says, I have loved you. You've experienced my love, so remain or abide, continue in my love. If you keep my commands, and he says, there's a connection between loving me and obeying me. If you keep my commands, if you do the things I've instructed you to do, you will remain or abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Jesus says, I have modeled for you what it looks like to live a life of obedience. And obedience is born out of love. So here's the thing I want you to understand as we think about obedience and what does it mean for our life and what does it mean for having a fresh start is that God calls you, if you are in Christ, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have been called to live a life of obedience. But that obedience isn't about, hey, here's a list of rules. Good luck. Try your best. Keep all the rules. You've got to earn your way. And if there's going to be a test, there's going to be an examination. No. Right? Jesus does for us what we could not. We are all rule breakers. Even you that are by nature rule keepers, right? We've all broken the rules. The Bible says we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. There's, there's no one that's righteous. No, not one. And so none of us, right? And the Bible shows us this, right? No one was able to completely obey God, even people who love God greatly. But Jesus did. He did for us what we could not do. He lived a life of obedience. He dies on our behalf. He rises from the dead and he offers us his obedience on our behalf, his righteousness exchanged for our unrighteousness. And if you have come to faith in Jesus, he has given you his righteousness. You are credited with his righteousness. It's the basis for your relationship with him. As Graham shared with us this morning, that our, our ability to approach God, right, to approach God with confidence, right, to approach God with boldness, 
right, is because of what Jesus did. We come in his name. We don't have a right to enter God's presence. He's too holy. He is too pure, right? It's not sinful people cannot come into the presence of such a glorious and perfect God. But Jesus made a way for you and I to do that and that we can come to God with full assurance and full acceptance. And if you are a follower of Jesus, he is calling you to live a life of obedience, but a life of obedience that's not rooted in following the rules, but of abiding in his love and that when you understand that God really does love you, that Jesus loves you, he really does, right? And, and we can be confident of this. You say, how do I know God loves me? Because sometimes maybe I don't feel like he loves me. But here's what the Bible says, that God demonstrated his love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus took your sin. He died on the cross. And so you say, I- I'm not sure if God loves me. Look at the cross. John 3, 16, you all know that verse. But put yourself there. For God so loved, right, so I'm going to say, for God so loved, and I want you to say, does everyone know their name? All right. If you don't, you should have a name tag, because sometimes we forget. All right, so check your name tag, all right? And then when I say, for God so loved, I want you to say your name. For God so loved, Dan, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. God really loves you. And Jesus wants you to receive and experience his love. And then he would say, I want you to abide. I want you to remain in my love. I don't want you to lose what it, your experience of my love. I don't want you to lose your knowledge of my love. And here's how you do that. Here's how you abide in my love. If you keep or obey my commands. And Jesus isn't saying, hey, if you love me, prove it by keeping my commands. He says, no, if, if you love me and if you've experienced my love, my love will lead you to obey me. It will be born out of, of love for me, that, of a desire to worship And that it's not out of have to, but I can. And Jesus modeled that for us. If you have your Bible open, Philippians chapter 2. And beginning in the second half of of verse 7. And Paul, as he writes about Jesus, he says, "When When he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even to death on a cross. And we've mentioned the cross already, but Jesus obeys the Father. He obeys God's plan for redemption, even at the cost of the cross. And, and you remember for Jesus, this was a heavy thing, right? The night before, you know, we've been in John chapter 15, just a little while after this, as he goes out to the garden to pray, he will beg his Father, Father, if there's any other way for you to accomplish your plan of redemption, if there's any other way to love the world, if there's any other way to redeem the world, then let this cup, this cup of judgment pass. But of course, Jesus knew, the Father knew, that there was no other way. And Jesus surrendered and submitted his will to the Father. He became obedient even to the point of death, to the death on a cross. And Jesus showed us what love looks like. And his death and resurrection not only demonstrate his love, but they give us the power to obey him. So look look at verse 9. In Philippians 2, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's only one rightful Lord in this universe. And men and women for centuries and centuries have sought to accumulate power and control. But there's only one rightful Lord, and his name is Jesus. And he alone is worthy of our allegiance and our obedience. And notice what Paul says as he continues to write this letter. He says, therefore, because of Jesus' life and death, because of his resurrection, because of the honor that God has put on him, he says, therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, But even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Paul says that because of what Jesus has done, he says, I want you in reverence to God to work out your salvation. That doesn't mean work for your salvation. You're already saved. You're saved by faith through grace. He says, but you do have to work out what God has worked in. God has saved you. You don't work for it. You don't earn it. 
But he says, what God has worked in you, he inv- calls us to work out, to live out, to participate with him. But notice he says that God is working in us. Look at verse 13. To both will and to work. So God is saying, I'm inviting you to work out your salvation, but I am working in you. That it's not even of your own effort or of your own ability to do this. But God is working in us, giving us even the desire to obey him. Right, that when we understand God's love for us, when we, when we experience God's radical love, His unconditional love that He offers us through Christ, He says that not only does that bring us to salvation, to faith, but it gives us a want to, a desire to obey Him. And He also gives us the power that He both wills and works in us. And so we don't have to manufacture obedience. We don't have to, we don't have to try so hard. We don't have to strive for it but we have to simply be and remain in God's love to abide in it, to obey Him, to do the things that He's instructed us to do. He says, if we'll do that out of love, we'll remain in His love. And obedience to Jesus is the pathway to genuine joy. And it's a a pathway to a genuine purpose in life. Notice notice there at the end of verse 13. He says that, that God is working in us both to will and to work according to His good purpose. God has a purpose and a plan for all things. And God has a purpose and a plan for your life. And I, I know that might seem very elementary, and maybe you've heard that, maybe you've heard it a hundred times, or maybe you've never heard it, but I want all of you to hear it today. God has a purpose for your life. God created you on purpose, He saved you on purpose, and He has a purpose and a plan for your life. And it was while I was a camper here that I discovered and knew for certain that God had a purpose and a plan for my life. And I want every one of you to know that. And God's purposes and plans for us all look different. Different pathways, different journeys, different callings, different careers. And none of them are more or less important than any other. But what is important for you to know is that God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. And obedience to Jesus is not only the pathway to real joy. Listen, God is a joyful God. I was on a mission trip uh, several years ago, and it was in the Dominican Republic, and we were uh, going around to Compassion International sites, and, and one of the things that we would do is the kids that were there would put on a program for us, because they were so excited to have visitors. And so in this one church, they, or this one Compassion site was at a church, they, they were singing and put on a program, and then they started a conga line, all right? As, and they were singing, and they invited us to get in the conga line with them. And, and they were, of course, singing in Spanish, and we asked, what, what, what? they said, well, this song is a song about how our God is a joyful God. And I'll tell you what, that place was filled with the most incredible joy. These kids lived in absolute poverty. They didn't have anything of the world, but they had a joy that was real, that was contagious. You couldn't help but be happy while you were there. I mean, it just it was impossible. And God is a joyful God. He is a God who is filled with joy, and He wants you to experience His joy. But joy isn't found in doing what you want. Joy isn't found in pursuing selfish desires. Joy is not found in pursuing sin. Now, there's pleasure in sin for a season. Some of you have discovered that. But the Bible says that 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 pleasure is fleeting and temporary. It's, It's false. It's not real. But there's real, genuine joy found in Jesus. And that is a found, you know, if you want to have a fresh start, if you want to relaunch your life, Right, obedience to Jesus is so essential, not only because it connects you to his purposes, but because you need his joy. Life on this earth is not easy. There are trials, there are difficulties at every turn. And God's joy is something that gives us strength to get through. And so obedience to Jesus brings genuine joy. John 15, 11, back at our last verse, it says, I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you. Jesus looks at his disciples. He says, I've told you these things. He says that my joy may be in you and that your joy might be complete. A joy that is deeper than circumstances. A joy that's deeper than anything that you could experience on earth. And Jesus wants that for you and for me. So I have two questions for you this morning. Two questions for you that you might want to jot down, that you might want to think about. Number one, Am I abiding in God's love for me? Am I abiding in God's love for me? Am I taking time to just be still at some moment during the day, each day, and remember that God actually loves me? 
that He sent His Son to die for me, that He cares for me, that He is good, that He has demonstrated His love. Because it's easy, it's easier than we think, easier than we realize to forget that. And so are you abiding in God's love? Because it's God's love that it's the soil from which obedience grows. Number two, am I walking in obedience to Jesus? Am I walking in obedience to Jesus? And just to honestly ask yourself that, to to honestly do some evaluation, to say, am I really walking in obedience to Jesus? Not just at church, not just at home, not just when I'm around my Christian friends, but am I walking in obedience to Jesus in my private life when no one's watching? Am I walking in obedience to Jesus in my school life when there's temptations? Temptations to live in a way that's contrary to the gospel. Temptations to cheat. Temptations to use AI to write your paper. Are you walking in obedience to Jesus in every area of your life? And if not, I invite you to confess it. To come clean. The Bible says that God is waiting to forgive us. Right? Uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's what? Faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God delights in fresh starts. He's waiting for you. Just, says, just bring it. You don't have to be afraid. Jesus paid for that sin already. He's not waiting to condemn you. He's not waiting to judge you. He's waiting to forgive you and to give you a fresh start. And maybe you need to talk to somebody and just say, I, I, the Bible says we confess our sins one to another. We can't forgive each other, but we can encourage each other. We can help each other. David, that we're going to talk about later this week, says that when he had sinned, he said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. Right? He realized that obedience was really the pathway to genuine joy. Uh, I've, I've loved since I was a child, and I found a couple interesting connections to it. The tune was written by a man named Carl Loudon, and he actually, he was from Jersey, which first of all makes him amazing, but he actually taught at what is today Cairn University, a long, long time ago, down in Philadelphia. And he had a tune that he had written a hymn to, but he didn't like the words, so he sent it to his friend Thomas Chisholm, who was living in Winona Lake, Indiana at the time. And he wrote these words. He says, Living for Jesus, a life that is true, striving to please Him in all that I do, yielding allegiance, glad-hearted and free, this is the pathway of blessing for me. Living for Jesus, who died in my place, Bearing on Calvary my sin and disgrace. Such love constrains me to answer his call, to follow his leading and give him my all. The chorus says, O Jesus, Lord and Savior, I give myself to thee, for thou in thy atonement did give thyself for me. I own no other master. My heart shall be thy throne. My life I give, henceforth to live, O Christ, for thee alone. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day that you've given us. I thank you for the opportunity for a fresh start even today on this Monday. I pray for a great day. I know it's a day filled with so many different things, new music, new, new schedules. I pray for each person that, that your power and grace would be upon them, that they have a great day. I pray that if they feel overwhelmed, that you would encourage them and remind them that you're with them. I pray your blessing over this day. May there be growth. May there be learning. May there be love. May there be joy. But Father, I pray that you would teach us to walk in obedience. And that if there's an area that we are not living in obedience to Jesus, that you would show us and convict us. That we might come to you and experience forgiveness and experience the true joy you want us to live in. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.